All right, well, it is uh, really exciting for me to be here, which is home here at the JCC. I want to thank Karen and Ronit and always Zach for uh, putting this great group together. And um, this is a great community. I'm really excited to get a chance to be with all of you, but also welcome my dear friend, Chelsea Clinton, to the JCC. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. I, I want to echo um, your thanks to the JCC and everyone who made this evening possible, um, as well as everyone uh, from the Churchill Club. And I just am so grateful that Cheryl took time out of her very busy life to talk with me about It's Your World. So thank you, Cheryl. All right, so Chelsea needs no introduction, but, but I'll give you one anyway. Uh, she's the vice chair of the Clinton Foundation. She's her PhD from Oxford in international relations and a master's in public health. She teaches health policy at Columbia. Um, she's really dedicated her life to unlocking human potential. And this book, It's Your World, uh, Get Informed, Get Inspired, Get Going, is testament to that. Um, I know a lot of us, those of us who are old enough, watched her grow up. So you feel like you kind of sort of know her? <laughs> I will tell you that the real Chelsea Clinton uh, is even more amazing than, than the one we all admired from afar. So I'm excited to share her with all my friends here tonight. All right, so let's start. Kelsey, you um, have a little bit going on, right? You've a got the bit. Clinton Foundation, you teach, you have a daughter who just turned one. Why, why would you write a whole book, and why this book? Uh, well, I kept talking to my nieces and nephews. I have 19 nieces and nephews. Yeah, wow, I know. My husband <laughs> has 10 brothers and sisters. And they're friends and other young people that we know, and I was just continually struck by how curious kids are about the world around us, how much more attuned and attentive I think kids are than often adults give them credit for being to what's happening in their own schools, in our communities, in our world. Um, and I also kept meeting amazing young people who were doing something about issues that they cared about, either bullying in their schools or helping to fight climate change. And I remembered a book that I had read when I was 10 or 11 called 50 Simple Things Kids Can Do to Save the Earth. And it had a profound impact on me because it treated me seriously. It didn't talk down to me. It wasn't pejorative. It treated me seriously as someone who, even though I was just a kid, deserved to know what was happening with climate change and pollution. And it empowered me with really practical suggestions of what I could do as a kid in Little Rock, Arkansas to make a difference on the issues that I really cared about. So I went looking for a book like 50 Simple Things today that I could share with my nieces and nephews and other young people to talk about what was happening in the world and what kids were doing and they then could do. And I couldn't find anything like that. So I decided to try to write that. So you divide it into three sections, get informed, get inspired, and get going. I think we have a lot of young folk here who would like to get informed, get inspired, and get going. Talk us through the three sections and how you thought of framing it this way and what those mean to you. So I thought of framing it um, along get informed. So kind of what is happening with access to education around the world? You know, here in the United States, for almost a century, since 1918, every kid has had the right to a free public education. And that's not true in a lot of the world. There are many barriers to getting an education around the world. There aren't enough schools. There aren't enough teachers. The schools that are there are often really far away. In many places, it's either illegal or strongly discouraged for a girl to go to school. And so I thought it would be hopefully interesting and certainly informative for kids here to understand why there are lots of reasons that almost 100 million kids aren't in school around the world today. And then get inspired sharing stories of young people who are trying to solve some of those challenges from the United States and in countries where kids aren't in school by standing up against child marriage and helping build schools, helping ensure there are more teachers being trained and being paid to do the important work of teaching, and then get going, kind of giving practical suggestions of what kids can do, working with clubs in schools here to raise money to build a school or help support a teacher, or even just raise awareness about the fact that there are still tens of millions of kids not in school around the world. Because I think we often take for granted, all of us of all ages, that people know things that we know. And that's genuinely not true, I found. 
And so I think raising awareness is also something that kids are uniquely positioned to do. Adults want to listen to you. So I think that's something that any kid can do. And so there are really practical suggestions at the end of each chapter, some of which take time, some of which do take money, um, but all of which just can take a little bit of energy and can really ensure that you make a difference. I think that's a great message. Everyone here ready? Raise your voice. All the kids, raise your hand. You're going to raise your voice? OK, good. So um, it won't shock you that I would like to start uh, with your chapter on gender equality. Uh, Chelsea has been a uh, early and great friend to me as I went down the path towards Lean In. You were one of the first people I told I was thinking of writing a book. And you was incredibly uh, supportive, which I'm still grateful for. Um, but you open with stories from your childhood. Um, and they're common stories. I did an event here at the JCC about them. But uh, in teachers uh, telling you not to speak up, telling you not to raise your voice, actually letting boys do things in your classroom that you didn't let girls told to be ladylike. Um, and you say now that you proudly call yourself a feminist, even though you don't think actions, you don't think the words matter, you think the actions matter. How do you think we help the communities understand that we still have these gender biases? How did you bring those stories to life here in your own, and what do you think we need to do about it? I think it's important um, that we recognize you know, in no country on earth do girls and women have the same rights and opportunities that men and boys do. Those barriers look different in different countries. And one of the things that I have found um, kids react to most strongly now that I've been um, talking about It's Your World over the last couple of weeks um, is the fact that there are 750 million women around the world who were married before the age of 18, and that one out of nine people on earth who will be married this year will be a girl under the age of 18. And that there are states in the United States, in our country, where you can legally be married under 18, including in Massachusetts, where a girl can get married at 12 if a court and her parents oh say it's God. okay. I had no idea. That she herself has no agency, she herself has no say. Um, and so I think it's important when we have this conversation, particularly as it relates to young people, that we talk about the whole scope of challenges that girls face around the world, but also here in the United States. And the story that Cheryl's talking about um, really is my first memory of being aware that I was a girl. I was in first grade. Um, we were at school late because it was a PTA meeting. And my mom was at the PTA meeting in the cafeteria. And I was um, kind of in the classroom that had been given over for all the kids to play in while we waited for our parents. And this little boy was just being really nasty to me. I call him John in the book, so because I hope he's turned out to be a really lovely person now, and I don't <laughs> want an enterprising reporter to track him down and say, like, why were you a bully, you know, 30 years ago? To um, Chelsea Clinton. So, yeah. <laughs> so, to good, me. good thinking. So, so I changed his name in the hopes that he's turned out lovely, um, but he was not lovely almost 30 years ago, and he um, just kept harassing me and harassing me, and at one point he pushed me down and he sat on me, and I, I asked him nicely to get off, and he just wouldn't get off. And finally, I kind of like, I shoved him off so I could stand up. And the teacher walked over to me and said, you know, that was not very ladylike behavior. And I was so taken aback. And, I, and it was such a sort of crisis, you know, for a six-year-old. Because I, I, I wanted to be polite. And I felt like I had tried to be polite. And that hadn't worked. But I also knew that I had to defend myself. And that it was never OK for someone to sit on me. I mean, I, I knew that. For example. Clearly, for example. And I am so grateful that. Um, I knew that I could talk to my parents about that and that I could go home and ask questions about kind of why that had happened and what did they think and had I done something wrong. Um, and I think that you know, we have to create safe spaces for girls to have those conversations around the world. I think that is something that is true regardless of the challenges that girls face. And those of us who have platforms, literally, like we have a platform, um, but as so many of us have platforms in our own families and schools and our work, um, have to create environments where that's never OK. Um, and I'm just so grateful that I had parents who created that environment for me and set that sort of moral compass, um, because that helped protect me from when I experienced, as I went on to later experience, other examples of, of men, but also some women who were uh, kind of stigmatizing at best and at other times sort of you know, very much trying to get me to lean back, not lean in. So since we're in Silicon Valley, and you've been very focused on this, you've done a lot, you talk about in the book, 
women in computer science, women in technology. So as much as we need women and girls to have equal voice and equal rights, we have a crisis in technology, which is that the numbers are going the other way as technology becomes more important. I know you feel strongly about this. Why do you think we need more women in technology and computer science? And what do you think is our path to get there? Well, I don't think we're going to live in the future that any of us want to live in if we continue to exclude effectively half of our potential and our promise. I mean, I think that's pretty self-evident. Um, and I think you know, what companies are doing in the Valley, you know, Facebook, Google, recognizing that it's in your interest to also ensure that there are more women in the pipeline is such a strong testament to that. Um, what China is doing from a state government perspective, looking to engage more young women in the STEM fields, is a recognition that it's in their national interest to ensure that women as men are continuing to go into these fields, continuing to innovate and create. And I think about kind of this challenge of Italy in the arc of my own life, as I talk about in the book. Um, in 1987, Santa Claus gave me a Commodore computer for Christmas. <laughs> I wish I still had it when sold at auction recently for $18,000. Uh, but it definitely did not make the trip. It's hard to go down the chimney with that. I mean, that was a it was impressive. lovely gift. It was impressive. I don't think it snowed that year, so it was easier. <laughs> um, and you know, in the mid-1980s, women were a third of computer science graduates in our country. And when I graduated from Stanford, just down the road, in 2001, women were about one in four. A little bit less, but about one in four. And now we're less than one in five. And so even though the denominator continues to grow, as more community colleges, four-year colleges, universities invest in building capacity for students to take and major in computer science, fewer and fewer women are participating. Um, and we know that this is a real challenge um, that starts really around the age that so many of you are and the age uh, that It's Your World hopes um, kids who read it will be, and really in middle school. And I know Cheryl knows this research as well, and even better than I do, that kind of from male and female teachers calling on girls less in math and science classes, even when girls raise their hands at the same rates, to the cognitive science, it says, around fourth grade, girls start imposing themselves in the stories that they see or they hear, rather than imagining their own stories. So, if you're seeing yourself only kind of as a princess or only as defined as your relationship to your father or to your brother or to someone that you work for, it's hard to continue to imagine yourself as the hero of your own story or to continue to imagine yourself as a real innovator, which is what so much of technology is fundamentally about. Um, so I think the good news is that we're now aware of a lot of how we wound up here but now we need pretty collective and complementary efforts from the private sector, kind of from the government, from school districts, from places like the JCC, um, who are engaged in kids' lives or who kind of set the rules that we all live by um, to ensure that more little girls want to grow up and be both Cheryl and Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> So global poverty, something you and I have spent a lot of time talking about, something you've cared about very passionately. Uh, the World Bank sets global poverty at $1.25 a day, and one in six people on the world live, live under that level. Um, you talked about learning about, in the book, you talk about learning about this when you were 15 years old on a trip to India and Pakistan. I'd love for you to share that story and share what you think kids so far away can do about people that are really at that kind of subsistence level. Well, what I uh, share in the book is that when I was uh, 15, I went on a trip to Southeast Asia with my mom. And what struck me first were actually seeing so many kids and then realizing the reason I was so surprised to see so many kids is because they weren't in school. And that we saw kids everywhere. Kids begging on streets, kids working in fields, kids clearly were walking to and from working in factories. And that was so shocking to me and sobering to me because I got to go to school. And so that's one of the reasons why I first got really interested in kind of this question of access to education around the world and one of the reasons why I included a whole chapter about education in my book. It also was the first time I'd ever seen kind of concentrated urban poverty. Growing up in Arkansas originally, I had been to parts of the Mississippi Delta and parts of the state um, where there were still people who lived in homes that had dirt floors, 
um, where people still were very much subsistence farmers. I had never seen anything like a slum, though, until I was in Southeast Asia. And seeing kind of areas where more than a million people lived in a place smaller than Palo Alto was really deeply shocking. And I think it should always be deeply shocking. I think we should always be concerned if we ever become inert and desensitized to people who live their whole lives sort of one square meter of space. Um, and yet we know that people sort of live and are trapped in poverty, again, because of many reasons. Um, and a big one for both people living in slum environments and also people who continue to live in rural poverty around the world, access to clean, safe water is one of them. So I talk about water a lot throughout It's Your World because it's really important. You know, if someone doesn't have access to clean water in an easy way, you know, often women spend two to three hours a day getting water for their families. If they don't spend that time and they and their kids drink bad water, their kids often get sick. And so that's time they're not in school, time they're not learning. It's time that parents can't be working because they have to stay home and take care of their kids. So some of the programs that I talk about that I think are really easy ways for kids to get involved are programs like Charity Water or Living Water International or water.org that have different ways, working with local communities around the world, building water systems that make sense for those communities. Because you can't just build a well anywhere and hope that it'll be safe and that it will have enough water. Um, and I highlight a young girl named Maddie, who's from Missouri in the book, um, who now has had a series of water walks, uh, each of which is 3.71 miles, because that's the average distance that a woman in India has to walk every day to get clean, safe water for her family. Um, and although some well systems are really expensive in the tens of thousands of dollars, many can be built for the hundreds of dollars. And so I think it's a way that, whether it's through Girl Scouts or through a school, where kids can really get together and raise money to build a well that can have a profound and lasting impact, not only for kids today, but kids in the future, somewhere far away, but that I think we all should feel connected to. Such a great point. So we have a lot of educators in this audience, uh, and my children attended preschool here at the JCC. I know there are a lot of teachers here. You talk a lot about education and how every child in the book has the right to education, but we're not delivering on that, on that obligation. What do you think this audience can do to help children in the United States and around the world get the education that they deserve, the kind of education that's provided to children who can come here? Well, I would say first, I think it's really important that kids be engaged in your own education. I mean, I say in the book, one of the reasons I don't talk about education very much in this country um, is because every kid here has the right to free public education. And again, that's not true for every kid around the world. Um, but also because I think that kids here and your parents know more about what the right answer is for your education um, than I do, certainly. I mean, I already have very strong feelings about my daughter's education, and she just turned one. <laughs> um, and I should be more worried about whether she's going to hit her head as she tries to learn to walk. Um, but on a serious point, I think that, oh, oh, is that me being played back to myself? That's a bit eerie, but yeah. kind of remarkable. Um, I think, though, I think there, I have, I have two um, answers to this question. The first is increasingly their efforts um, to enable peer-to-peer -peer teacher training around the world. Um, because although there's so much of a focus on the need to build more schools, and that's hugely important, we need twice as many schools as we have across the whole United States, probably, to ensure that every child can get into and stay in school. But we need at least 4 million more teachers around the world. And so there are a number of still nascent but exciting programs to allow and enable um, teachers in this country to help mentor teachers around the world. And so that's something I hope that teachers will be interested in and, and take part in. Um, and that's true for early childhood as well as kind of through high school. And then the second is we do need more schools. And so I talk about a couple of programs in It's Your World. Building Tomorrow that focuses on building schools, uh, predominantly in Uganda, but also throughout East Africa. And then Pencils of Promise that focuses on building schools in Laos and Cambodia and parts of Central and South 
America um, and enables people to also even just build part of a school so that groups of kids or classrooms or again sort of Girl Scout troops can raise you know a hundred dollars to help build a classroom or to help ensure that there are books in the classroom because yes they're still largely using books and not kind of technology so again I think there's so many ways to engage and this is an area where there are meaningful ways for teachers to engage uh, that are unique but potentially really powerful. So this audience is also filled with parents, and you are a new parent of your now one-year-old daughter, and you talk in the book a lot about the influence not just your mother had on you, but your grandmother's. And I'd love to hear you to share with the audience, um, you know, not just how they influenced you, but how you influenced them. There's a great story in here about your convincing your father's mother to stop smoking. Yes. And there may be things, hopefully no one's smoking, my pediatrician sister uh, would like me to say, but, but there may be things that children here would like to convince their parents or grandparents to do. So how, how, how are you that persuasive with your parents or well, grandparents? I, so my, my grandmother, Ginger, who Cheryl's referring to, um, who she passed away when I was 13. So I never got to know her as an adult. Whereas my mom's mom, uh, my grandma Dorothy, passed away a few years ago. And so I was blessed to know her as a kid and then as an adult, uh, and I still miss her fiercely, and she remains a major influence in my life. Um, my grandmother, Ginger, um, asked me what I wanted for my eighth birthday. And I had just read um, a, a, the whole Ramona Quimby series by Beverly Cleary. And in one of the books, um, Ramona uh, goes on a campaign to get her father to quit smoking. And she makes these signs that say, no nah smoking, because she couldn't fit no smoking on one line. And I remembered that so so clearly as I was thinking about writing this book. And I threatened my grandmother like with an all-out campaign. I was like, I'm going to put up signs. I'm going to take away all your ashtrays. <laughs> so I'd like to think that she did it because it's what I asked for for my birthday. But definitely um, the, the threatened punitive measures may have been part of it, too. Oh, because so I was also like, I'm not going to come here anymore. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it, was, it was kind of remarkable, but also kind of terrifying when I think about my not-quite-eight-year-old self. But sure enough, she quit smoking, and it wound up being really a lot of fun because we spent so much time together to distract her from when she was smoking. So we cooked and baked together a lot. So I have really wonderful memories from that time because she was so determined to actually quit. And to fast forward, she was later diagnosed with um, breast cancer that uh, quickly metastasized throughout her body. Um, and her doctor said, you know, we don't know how much extra time she had because she quit smoking, but she probably had at least a little extra time because she had stopped smoking. And that was such a better gift than I had ever imagined when I asked for her to quit smoking for my eighth birthday. And my grandmother, Dorothy, um, was just such a remarkable person, partly because she had had a life that I couldn't even imagine. And she had lived her life in such a way so that her granddaughter could have never imagined her life. She was abandoned by her parents twice before the age of eight. And when she was eight, she was put on a train um, from Chicago to Southern California with her then two-year-old sister by themselves. Almost two days to get there at that time. And she lived with her then grandparents who, um, right before her 14th birthday, uh, kicked her out of the house um, because they said that she was old enough to support herself. And she got a job working as a maid in what she called a mother's helper, basically a nanny for a family that had three young children. And she woke up really early every morning, and she did her cleaning work and all the laundry. And then she went to school, which was, her high school was five miles away, so she often had to run to school. Um, and she went to school, and then she came back, and then she helped uh, take care of the three little kids, helped bathe them, and put them to bed. And... She later like, got herself a typing job and put herself through secretarial school. And one day, a man walked in asking for directions, and that was my grandfather. And then she helped him with his small drapery business in Chicago. And although she had no intimate experience in her own life of love or kind of a family environment sort of based on and centered on love and nurturing, she created that environment from my mother and my uncles which I just think is so remarkable. And she had this adage that has become this mantra in my family, as Cheryl knows, that life is not about what happens to you, it's about what you do with what happens to you. And her life was a real testament to that. 
And she was born in our country before women had the right to vote. And she lived long enough to vote for her daughter for president. So I think that's a pretty extraordinary story. And so I think about my grandmother every day um, and what I can and should be doing to try to live up to her example. And I talk to my daughter about her great-grandmother because it's really important to me that she knows how lucky she is to be her grandmother's great-granddaughter. Yay. <laughs> that was so great. Um, so we're going to do a lightning round. Okay. Quick answers. Okay. Ready? All really, really easy questions. Okay. D.C. or New York? New York. Stanford or Columbia? Stanford. Good answer. <laughs> Play into the crowd. Socks or buddy? Oh, that's hard. That, oh, I, that I can't choose. I, I have to say socks because I knew socks better, but buddy was a really special dog. Pampers or huggies? Oh, pampers. Crayons or Play-Doh? Well, neither yet. <laughs> Horton hears a who or the places you'll go? Horton hears a who. Charlotte's Web or Charlotte Bronte? Charlotte's Web. Chicken or ribs? Chicken. Coffee or tea? Coffee. <laughs> mountains or beach? Uh, mountains. Late night or early mornings? Both. <laughs> <laughs> Unbreakable Kimmy Sch Schmidt or Orange is the New Black? Orange is the New Black. <laughs> Private sector or NGO? Both. Food aid or cash aid to countries in crisis? Cash aid to countries in crisis. Last book you read? Oh, what was the last book I read? That's a really, I'm trying to think of a non-parenting non. Well, the, last, the, the actual answer to this is, where is the green sheep? Which is the last <laughs> book I read before I put my daughter to sleep last night. But I guess that is the honest answer. It's a good answer. Favorite TV show? Turn. Ryan Adams or Taylor Swift? Ryan Adams. John Oliver or Trevor, Trevor Noah? John Oliver. Bagel or Bialy is a very big question. This crowd. Um, Pick well, carefully. I'm, I'm gluten free. Bagel. Gl okay. Gluten free bagel. I don't think I've ever had if a gluten free If you were going to have. But if, but if there is a gluten free okay. bagel, send it my way. Game of Thrones or Veep? Game of Thrones. Yankees or Mets? Mets. First thing you do in the morning? First thing, put on my glasses. <laughs> Last thing you do at night? Um, say goodnight to my husband. <laughs> Best piece of advice you were ever given? Life's not about what happens to you. It's about what you do with what happens to you. And this is from my son. Who are you voting for for president? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely my mom. Thank you very much. All right, we are going to uh, the remarkable Chelsea Clinton. We are going to pass the mic and take questions. And we'll request that the questions are you know, kind of tight and kind of have questions to them. <laughs> Just so everyone gets a chance. How, how old were you when you started um, supporting equal rights? How old was I when I started supporting equal rights? Well, as soon as I found out that we didn't have equal rights, so I, I guess when I was six is the honest answer. I know. Oh. Oh. oh, how about here and then there? Is that all right? Yeah. Maya? I know internationally schools and education are a big problem, but I know in some places in the U.S. public schools are, are not as good as they could be, so what do you think about that and what do you want to do about it? So I think that is a very real question, and I'll give you um, an example. When my mom ran for Senate in 2000, this is one of those sort of improbably true stories. She was campaigning in upstate New York, and a teacher said to her, can I show you what my biggest challenge is? And my mom said, well, of, of course. And she opened the science textbook that she was still using in 2000, and it said, one day we'll send a man to the moon. <laughs> right, which we did in 1969. So, you know, oh, wow. Yeah, oh, wow. Uh, so I think oftentimes uh, this, the, the conversation about education in this country in very unhelpful ways gets siloed into conversation sort of just about teachers or just about technology or just about um, kind of the aesthetic of schools or just about et cetera. But it's so different. But I think the real question, Maya, if this is something that you really care about, you should think about what the issues are in the school district where you live and what you think are causing those issues. 
So is it that you don't think teachers are well enough trained? Is it you think that they're not teaching you what you want and need to know for the 21st century? Do you not have enough physical education? That's actually a big deal in our country now. Fewer than 10% of American kids have daily PE class in public schools across our country, um, which means kids are less likely to pay attention in class, less likely to retain and to learn what's happening. So thank you for asking your question. Um, but I, on this one, have to throw it back to you <laughs> and say, kind of figure out what the issues are in the districts um, that you care about or where you're going to school and then talk to your parents about what you want to do about them. So, hi. Um, I just want to talk, for example, what Maya just said. It kind of shows how intelligent the kids are and how involved they are here in Silicon Valley. I can only talk because this is where I live. But um, how do you tell them? I know they've got Facebook pages for, like, play for equal pay, right, which was shared um, a lot, thank you, to lean in, um, that my daughter has. What would you recommend to kids that may have Facebook pages or done GoFundMes or whatever to kind of get more um, eyes on their causes? I think Cheryl's probably the person who could better <laughs> answer that than I can, Sorry, candidly. I'll it out there. Um, so I'll defer to her, and I would be interested to hear what she has to say on this. I think um, one of the challenges, certainly when I had, was talking to the kids that I highlight in the book, and one of the things that we didn't talk about before is that um, the kids that I highlight in the book, some of them I knew before I started the book. Some of them were part of the inspiration for me writing the book. Some of them I um, kind of came to know of through organizations that I really respect. I just saw my friend Cassie over there who works with Partners in Health. Some of them were kids who recommended each other. Some of them were kids who were like, you know, I know this person kind of through my social media, or I know this person because we both kind of won um, recognition from the National Girl Scouts um, on this issue. And so I think um, I, w I would say that I would look at sort of what those kids have done who have big social media presence or kind of have lots of eyes on their website. I write about um, this young woman, Haley, from Arizona, who, when she was seven, decided to become the family chef to help... Um, her father fight his diabetes. And she started um, then helping her friends, and then she built an online kind of kids cooking platform, and now she does all the kids' meals for Hyatt Hotels. Um, and you can, she's kept all the history on her website. So that might be an interesting um, kind of look back in history of kind of how she did what she did to gain more and more traction, because um, she has tens of thousands of kids looking at her website every, every month for recipes. Um, but for the Facebook question, I'll be curious what Cheryl has to say. You know, it's pretty an interesting time when you think about going back even 10 years ago. If you were a kid or most adults, you couldn't publish anything to anyone, right? There was no ability to self-publish or have voice. So what Facebook does, along with the rest of social media, is gives, and gives anyone access to publish. It's also pretty crowded out there, right? So I think, you know, the best practices are pictures are really important, not just words. They really tell stories in ways people can rec can can understand. Um, short, succinct, informative posts, and talking to your friends about it the same way we always did, but doing it with social media and in person. And I think I mean one of the things, and that Cheryl just sparked another um, thought for me. I mean one of the things that I worked really hard um, for with It's Your World was that it would sound like I was talking to someone. Right, that it would that reading it would sound like I was having a conversation with one of my nieces or nephews um, in a way that would be accessible to kids but also have real integrity to the issues um, because I think kids have a really good um, kind of monitor for what's authentic and what's not authentic and I think that's as true sort of on the written page as it would be on a Facebook post I think that's important too yeah. in the back yeah there. who is the mic I think we have a, a great person. yes um, thank you so much for coming um, so how did you decide what you wanted to be when you grow up, and what's your favorite part of the job? So when I was, how old are you? How old? I'm 13. So when I was your age, what's your name? Sarah. Sarah. So when I was your age, Sarah, I wanted to be a doctor. I'd always been really interested in, in medicine, in kind of what I came to understand um, as, as health more broadly. Um, but as I got older and when I was at Stanford, I realized I was more interested in public health and sort of the systems 
Um, and the, de the determinants, whether in our environment or our healthcare system, whether in hospitals or clinics or what doctors are taught or not taught, um, and how that related to how healthy individuals are, but how, also how healthy whole societies are. Um, so I had a real evolution from kind of being interested just in, in medicine to being interested in public health and then being interested in um, sort of the larger systems around health. Um, and my favorite part of my job is continuing to learn kind of all the amazing things that people are doing um, in public health or in, this is amazing. Sorry, I've just never, I've never, I've never had an experience like this. Um, you were all here for my first beam, um, and and so my favorite, my favorite part of, of the work that I do now um, is, is is meeting like really smart, energetic people who are 13 or or 30 or 90 who are interested in the same types of challenges I'm interested in and trying to solve them together in a way that's um, more effective and can be done more quickly and ideally m more cheaply. We're going to have to go here. Beam, yeah. ha Beam has a question. Yeah, um, <laughs> we have to take that one. Hi, my name is Hamilton, uh, and I went to school in Palo Alto, and I'm in New York right now. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here and talking with us. But uh, my question was just, uh, when you're encountered by uh, bullying or, you know, adverse treatment, how was the mature way to make it stop, but also, you know, do the right thing? Well, thank you, Hamilton, um, for your question. I think it's a really important one uh, for all of us of any age. Um, I have found, as someone who has been on the receiving end of a fair bit of bullying in my life, that I now, now thankfully can recognize that it's always about the bully. It's never about me, but it's always about the bully. And I think that's a really important place to start from. Um, I also recognize that now, as a 35-year-old, I'm much more able to disentangle myself um, or, if need be, respond, hopefully gracefully, always calmly, um, to whatever I'm on the receiving end of. But I don't think it's, it's fair for us to expect other people who haven't been inundated with bullying in the way that I have been in my life to have those same responses. And I think it's probably not safe always for us to expect kids to do that. So as I write about in It's Your World, I think it's important for those of us who see bullying, if we're kind of older um, and can do something about it, to do something about it, or to get help. You know, there's no shame in asking for help. You know, none of us can solve every problem on our own. And hopefully none of us should ever feel or be alone. So I think it's important that we ask for help for people that we know who can really help us solve whatever that challenge is. So if we see bullying, ask a teacher or ask our parents or ask another trusted adult and, and don't wait um, because no one's gonna fault you for asking for help. Thank you for being here today. What two lovely examples you are. One of my favorite quotes, be the change you wish to see in the world. So I'm just inspired to see all the young people. As an American government high school teacher, I would love for you to share how much do you love the Constitution and how important is it for young people to really know and really know and be committed to it? Um, well, thank Great you for question. being a teacher. And thank you for teaching American government because you are at the crux of what I kind of was, was talking about earlier um, in that I don't think often we understand enough in our country um, for adults and kids, which is what level of government do we need to try to persuade to help make a difference on an issue that we care about? I mean, I, I have so many kind of um, memories as I think about this where people would come up, up to me um, kind of, you know, all of a couple of years ago when this was still an issue in our country and say, like, why can't President Obama just make gay marriage legal? I'd say, well, because marriage is a state-by-state -state, um, authority in our country. Right? The president can't really just make that happen. Or people would come up um, to me. On, it's the great thing about riding the subway in New York City is that I, I, I understand sort of what's in the zeitgeist because people come up and talk to me a lot. Or, or people would come up to me and say, you know, I really think President Obama needs to do more on recycling. And I would say, like, I, I bet that he does recycle at the White House. Like, I don't know that, right? But I, I, bet, I bet that he and Mrs. Obama are probably, like, pretty good about separating out their trash. But recycling happens at the local level. So if you really feel that way, like, you need to write. To Mayor Bloomberg at the time, um, and Speaker Finney and Speaker of City Council. Uh, so I think what you're doing is so important. 
I think the Constitution is tremendously important. Um, I find the Second Amendment equally yeah. troubling. Um, and I wish that I could. Uh, I wish I could talk to our founders about maybe being a little more precise. I mean, any document that gets written effectively in three weeks um, clearly is going to have some challenges, and that the Bill of Rights was written um, in even a shorter period of time. Um, before, like, semi-automatic weapons, for example. Yeah, yeah. Or, or back before we actually had a national military. So we did rely on, you know, well-ordered militia. You know, I think it's important for those of us who really care about this to not gloss over the history. I mean, we have to be cognizant of the history. Um, so I think it's, it's important um, for each of us to make up our own minds about kind of why, what we think of the Constitution, I guess, kind of what parts we believe are fundamental to not only our country's past, but the country that we want to continue to live in, and what parts would we want to change and even amend. And I think that's something that all of us have to answer for ourselves. Whoever has the mic. Oh, um. Hi. Um, my question to you is, um, girls feeling in fear starts at home, right? Because their parents are more protective of girls than they are of boys. And when they want to try something new, they say, oh, no, that's for a guy. That's a man's job. You have a daughter of your own. What would you show your daughter that's, like, try to teach her different? What's your opinion on that? Uh, well, I, question. I want my daughter to do and, and be whatever she wants to be. Um, I also think it's my responsibility as her parent to help her be able to make um, responsible and safe choices. I think that's equally true if Mark and I are so blessed to have a son at some point. Um, so I think what's most important is ensuring, at least in our house, that our children are receiving the same messages and the same messaging um, from their mother and their father. Um, and I think we just have to continue to hold ourselves accountable to that. If anything, um, we might overcorrect, not undercorrect. Um, I, I have to, I, it has to be okay if my daughter really just like wants to grow up and only wear pink dresses. Like, I, that's going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, hi, thank you so much for coming today. Um, so you've already accomplished so much, but... Where do you see yourself in 10 years? You know, I don't, I don't know. And I don't know because I honestly don't think of my life that way. And I've never thought of my life that way. I mean, I have friends who have sort of 10-year plans. I mean, I have friends who have 20-year plans. I am a real planner, um, but I plan on shorter increments of time. So I can tell you what um, Mark and I hope to accomplish for our family over the next couple of years, because very much now, being a mom, um, my daughter's the most important part of my life by far. Cheryl and I were talking earlier. I, I don't really know what I did before I became a mom. I mean, I know what I did because I can look back and like see all that I. But did. you had so much free time. But I, mean, just, just, yeah. no, I don't. I don't. All know. of a sudden, all, I just feel like everything else that I did before, while important, um, this is just a whole other universe that I know every every parent in the audience can understand. Uh, so when I look forward to the next few years, we hope to have more children. Um, I want to see how It's Your World goes. Um, I want to see uh, kind of whether or not it would make sense to do something else as a follow-up to this or not. Um, at the Clinton Foundation, I continue to be really excited about all the data-driven work we're doing around girls and women, so I want to keep doing that. Um, with the Clinton Health Access Initiative, which is our kind of major global health effort, we're doing more and more on women and girls' health. So I hope that we can say, you know, in a measurable sense, where we've helped have an impact on helping more mothers stay alive and more babies stay alive and then go on to lead healthy lives. So there are specific things that I, I want to do. Um, but kind of first and foremost, I want um, my daughter to be proud to be my daughter and to know that she's loved and that she's protected and healthy and happy. And I hope that we can give her younger siblings. Um, so my question was, um, what are your thoughts on the higher education system, specifically with everyone, everyone wanting to go to a four-year college but not being able to afford it? Um, I think that's a great question. Uh, and, you know, after World War II, um, about 8%-ish 8, 8 
of Americans went to college. You know, last year, um, more than half of Americans of college age were in some form of higher education. Uh, so if we look at changes in the last few generations, uh, we would be hard pressed after kind of thinking about everything um, related to the internet and social media to point to kind of a, a bigger shift than the entrance of many more Americans into the higher education system. And I don't, I don't know what the answer to your question is. I think we're asking those questions now because clearly people think they're not getting a return on investment for their education. Um, and I think also because there's so many more people in school now than their parents or grandparents were in school. So it's not only kind of the financial question, but I think it's also a psychological question because so many people now are having just fundamentally different experiences um, and experiences that they may or may not be able to see have greater results in higher incomes or kind of greater life satisfaction and happiness um, than their parents and grandparents did. Uh, but again, I think this is a question that each of us has to answer for ourselves, you know, and that every family has to answer for itself. Um, so I'm wary of kind of coming up with kind of macro suggestions, because I often find, particularly when it relates to higher education, the people making those suggestions are always talking about someone else's children. So I think that they are appropriate questions to be asking um, kind of at a national and a state policy level. Um, but again, I think this is an area where every person has to make what we think are the right choices for ourselves. I think we're going to have time for about two more questions. So, yeah. So um, you've been talking a lot about the struggles people face all over the world. How do you stay optimistic through all that? Oh, I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic for a couple of reasons. First, in total confession, I just don't find cynicism very useful. <laughs> I mean, it's just not very productive. Like, I, it, no, no one ever had, no, no one ever created anything because they were a cynic. No one ever changed anything because they were a cynic. And I generally find cynicism to be kind of the preserve of people who want to protect the status quo. And I don't want to be with the people that want to protect the status quo. So I'm, I'm just, I think I'm just naturally not cynical. Um, also, I'm not cynical because for all the places in the world where we haven't made progress, there are even more places where we have made progress. So you know, 15 years ago, there were more than 200 million kids not in school. So there are still more than 100 million kids not in school. And that's tragic. 100 million, though, is a lot less than 200 million. Um, but we now know a lot about what works. We just need to be doing more of what works around the world, and I believe that we can get there. All right, someone gets the last question. Whoever has the mic. Anyone have a mic? Uh, yeah, oh, right hi. there. Um, so we've all been informed, I think, through the education that we get, and you've just inspired all of us, but how can 15-year-old girls or any middle school or high school age students get going now? Um, well, I think that's a great question. I think it depends on what you care about. I mean, I think we all care about something. I mean, I said this briefly earlier. So often people ask me, well, what do you think kids should care about? And I always say, we well, should ask kids. They will tell you what they care about. Um, so I think you have to figure out what you care most about, kind of whether that is something that makes you angry or something that inspires you or maybe both, and then figure out what you can do. Because I think all of us really can do something. So whether that's raising awareness or donating time or raising money, you can do whatever feels right to you to make a difference in whatever you care about. And I hope that my book helps you do that. So um, as part of, I think, I was trying to think of the best way we could thank Chelsea for coming. And I think the best way we can do that is if everyone takes a minute and think about one area you care about, something you want to do, and then maybe you already have an idea of something you want to do, but if not, this book, great ideas, the end of every chapter. Um, but let's all, this is, I think, our best way of thanking her. Everyone take a minute, especially the kids here. Think about an area you care about. Make yourself a quiet little pledge to do something. Everyone? Um, again, I'm so glad I got to share my friend with my community. And I hope you all are in, as inspired by this amazing woman as I am. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Chelsea.